Valerio Pisiconi, Offensive Interference. Greetings to all. Today we will speak about offensive interference. This refers to a team on offense that obstructs the defensive team from performing their defensive responsibilities. This is an interesting topic for us to discover, and we will dive deeper into the theory and application of how this impacts a game of baseball. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Valerio Pisiconi, and I've been working with FIPS since 2006. Therefore, I am in my 15th year of work. I have umpired for the CEB since 2013. I received my certification from Bratislava, and in 2013, I umpired the B level of the European Championship in Zurich. The first case I have selected for today is that of batter interference. Let us examine the example of a hitter interfering with a catcher who attempts to throw out a potential base dealer. On this slide, we see all the physical parameters that need to be considered according to the rules of the game. The rule states very clearly that the batter will cause interference should he step out of the batter's box or make any other movement that hinders the actions of the catcher. The batter has the right to be in the batter's box, but he must be fully within its confines in order to not cause obstruction, and as an umpire, we must remain aware of him moving outside of it. We must also be aware as umpires of his body language and actions made with the bat, which all factor into the decision of whether or not he has interfered with a catcher. Umpires must be able to state that throughout the entire time of hitting, the batter gave the catcher a clean vision of the pitcher so that he could perform his duties. Here we are only speaking about the cases of unintentional interference. The final ruling is very important because when outs are made on the bases, notwithstanding interference called at the plate, the ball remains live and the game continues as usual. Keep aware of the catcher's movements because if he does not make the effort to throw out a base runner, the play will not be called as interference. Allow me to play a video that illuminates this case of batter interference. George on the move again. Alex swings through it. The throw is high, and Springer has himself a stolen base. We're going to get a, a interference called on Bregman. That's going to be a double play. Alex Bregman apparently interfered with the throw by Brett Nicholas in crossing over the plate, so Springer will be out at second. AJ Hinch, an ex-catcher out there having a talk with Chris. That's there was no contact, but he did fall across in front of home plate, which is usually the key for some umpires to call it. You see Chris Siegel pointing right away. Springer originally was safe, and Alex was well across the plate. So West got right in. in this case, we have seen that there was no physical contact between the hitter and the catcher, but given that the hitter left his batter's box and hindered in the catcher's ability to throw out the base runner at second base, interference was called. Let us watch another example of a hitter who leaves his box. Step on the lead. He is going. Pitch swung, tipped, and caught, and in safely is Story. Uh oh, we're the home plate umpire calling interference. Yep. 
He's saying that Lucroy interfered with the throw. So two outs. So Story's going to be out at second base. How about that? In this case, there was not an intentional act of interference on the part of the hitter. However, since the hitter swung and obstructed the catcher in his attempt to throw out a potential base dealer, interference was called. Here's the final example of interference. Again, with a hitter leaving his box is as follows. Runner goes, got a good jump. Here's the throw down to second. A little bit late. And I did a heck of a job. We're going to call oh, interference on, yep. on Fielder. Batters out, runner back to first. Take a look at Chris Iannetta. Tough pitch. He's able to pick it cleanly, and then Fielder comes right across in front of him, and there is contact there. And Chris turns around and lets Jim Joyce you know right away that there was interference. I think that was a good call. Mm -hmm. Prince trying to get out of the way, doing the right thing, but he went in the wrong direction. And a Mariners benefit. Put out to Iannetta. I, I'm not sure that Prince could have done much about it. You can see him moving his feet, and then he falls forward, and I don't think he could stop his momentum at that point. Perfect well. He'd have loved to have cleared without making contact. But. And I think that's what the argument is right here, that he, there was nothing that he could do about it, but Jim Joyce made the call right away. Two down. Runner at first. Not an animated discussion to this point. Bannister pleading his case. Mr. Joyce is the arbiter. He's going to have the final. Even though the batter does not interfere willingly, he does so as his momentum takes him across the plate as he makes an attempt to get out of the way of the pitch. This is still correctly called as interference. Now we will watch videos that show how even the slightest actions interfere with a catcher's ability to perform his responsibilities. These videos show that even though the batter remains in the box, he is still obstructing the catcher with his actions. Caesar takes off. Here's the throw from Ionetta. And he's in there. Score one for Villanova that time. For Darno, pardon me. Yeah, I believe they're going to call him out at second base. That is a heads up play by Chris Iannetta. The interference took place at home plate, Cordoba. In this case, we see that the hitter obstructs the catcher with his body, despite his feet remaining planted within the batter's box. He did not allow for a clean line of vision for the catcher to perform his duty of throwing out the potential base stealer. There's the 1 0. -oh. Jackson's on the move. A little hit and run action. A swing and a miss. Low throw. The coward can't dig it out. The ball gets away. Now Jackson will end up at third. I think you're going to bring him back because he was interfered with. And he's going to call him out or put him back at first base on yep. the throw. Sure enough, that's what they're going to do. He's got to go back to first base. And you see Adam Hamari looking right down as he leaves that bat as far as trying to get that follow through on the throw. As you can see, it definitely had a, an impact on the follow through from Martin Maldonado. Even in this case, after the swing, the hitter has partially left the confines of his box and the bat interferes with the catcher's ability to throw out the potential base dealer. What is the correct gesture for an umpire to declare interference? In the case of interference, an umpire must indicate specifically where the obstruction occurred and use a louder voice to make sure that all on the field are aware of the call. At this point, we must attend to what has happened on the base paths. If the out was still made by the catcher, as umpires, we must leave the situation as is. 
Instead, if an out was not made, the ball will be declared as dead and we call the hitter out for his illegal action, while all base runners return to the previous base. If there are two outs and two strikes on a hitter, a third strike would simply retire the side. The batter would not be declared out if the catcher's throw retires a base dealer, regardless of the interference on the part of the hitter. Pay attention to instances of the double steal. Here, a third strike will retire the batter as well as the runner at the base where the catcher intended to make a play based on the batter's interference. Intentional cases of interference will have the same repercussions, but other declarations may be made by the umpire in charge based on acts of unsportsmanlike conduct. The second case we will discuss today is the interference on the backswing of a hitter. The rule states that if a batter swings at a ball and misses but swings so hard that he carries the bat all the way around and in the umpire's judgment unintentionally hits the catcher or the ball the catcher is attempting to receive on his backswing, this will be declared as backswing or follow-through interference. This action is completely unintentional, but still declared as interference. I have selected videos that include interference on the backswing and obstruct the catcher from attempting to throw out a base dealer. There goes another runner. Throw is on the money. But Russell Martin gets hit by the back swing, and the umpire has called the runner out for interference. Molitor out to argue. Martin appears to be okay. But there was contact made by the batter, Nunez. And Lance Barksdale never hesitated. He called him out immediately for the contact made on Russell Martin. Watch the finish. Hits him right in the head. And that's a no-no. It sends Russell down. But the Blue Jays sends them into the dugout ready to hit. This video illustrates interference on the backswing of the hitter as he makes contact with the catcher attempting to throw out a base dealer, as well as interference because the hitter leaves the confines of his box. This is therefore known as strong interference. Let us break down weak and strong interference. Weak interference always has interference on the part of the hitter, but because the ball is dead, we must await what proceeds. Strong interference is determined on the part of the umpire because of further actions that took place on the field. An example is as follows. Hit and run is on high throw and Coggins in there safe. They're calling him out. They're calling him out. Oh, my. Toby Bazner, the home plate umpire. That's just on the swing. How can you call him out on the back swing? He didn't do it on purpose. DeMarlo Hale is the manager. Remember, John Gibbons got thrown out last inning. And Hale said, what are you talking about? The batter has the right to the batter's box. He can stand there and do everything. And the catcher got hit by the follow through. Travis hasn't done anything wrong. He's just finishing his swing and getting out of the way. And Maldonado's trying to sell it to him. Travis is called out. Coglin goes back to first. In this case, we have seen interference on the part of the hitter as he partially leaves the confines of his box. The ruling would be made as strong interference. Now let us see a very interesting example. This made history in 2017 and resulted in a rule change. This is interference on a backswing with two strikes to the hitter. 
The ball is immediately declared as dead by the umpire. The batter is declared out by strikeout, and base runners must return to their previously occupied base. Let us see what transpired. Straight three, but the ball gets away. And Baez is going to be safe at first, and a run is going to score. Here comes Russell. Runners are at second and third. Wieters is contending he got hit with the follow through of the bat. If that's the case, that changes everything. They're calling the umpires in here. The umpire crew immediately congregated at the completion of this very interesting play. This required further analysis by all umpires. It was later claimed that the ball was to be declared as dead. The hitter was to be retired due to interference on the catcher with his backswing, and all base runners were to return to their previous base. The umpire stated that the catcher was no longer in the act of receiving the ball. Instead, it got by him. Therefore, that which took place, the act of interference, had no effect on how the game proceeded, and as such, it was declared to be shown in the video. Going forward, as the hitter had two strikes, he would be declared out and the ball declared dead. The interpretation may change based on cases where the hitter does not have two strikes and there are other runners on base. For example, if there are runners on first or second base and a pass ball where the baseball goes to the backstop, according to my interpretation as an umpire, all would continue as normal. However, some doubt does remain if there was a runner on third base who was attempting to score. At that point, the catcher would have the responsibility to make a play at home with the runner advancing. It is then my personal opinion that this ball should be declared dead with all runners returning to their previously occupied bases before the interference took place. In the case of strong interference followed by the backswing of the hitter, as in the first instance, the umpire would call interference, the hitter is out, the ball is dead, and all base runners must return to their previously occupied base. The third case to be discussed today is batter-runner interference. This takes place when a hitter, who becomes a runner after putting the ball in play, obstructs the defensive team from performing their responsibility by running outside of the dedicated baseline along first base. This extra line, as you can see on your screen, is only included on the second half of the distance between home and first base. This lane helps provide a guide for the catcher who is guaranteed a clear view of first base in order to perform his defensive duties because he knows that the batter runner will follow this lane. Should the batter runner not stay in this three-foot lane with both feet, interference may likely be called on a play at first base. A batter runner is permitted to run along the first base foul line, but must not stray off the line, according to the judgment of the umpire, as this would interfere with a catcher attempting to make a throw to first base. Another concept to take note of is that the batter runner is permitted to stray from this line only in the case of avoiding a fielder, a first baseman or a pitcher, who is attempting to tag them out as they make their way to first base and attempt to reach safely. Let us break down when this type of interference can be called. This could happen when the base runner is running outside of his running lane 
when there is a play at first base and when the umpire decides that his path has now interfered with the fielder receiving a throw at first base. Let us watch an example. Bradley Jr. above average as well. The one delivery's bunting. It's a safety squeeze. And they're going to come in and score. Throw will go to first and get the out. Ooh. Tough play as Brewer looked home and then had to do a 360, but a fine bunt laid down and scoring from third base Santander. Yeah, and great. the Orioles tie it up. Yeah, great play right here. And I think they're going to review this play here to make sure that the umpires are going to meet on this. There's not a challenge here. Because that play is in front of the bag. Discussion going on with Brandon Hyde now. Crew chief is Mark Carlson, the second base umpire, who is in there with a home plate umpire, Trip Gibson. And thrown out is Brandon Hyde. Hyde just got heaved because that is what they're saying. There was interference. The base runner was out of the base pass and he just got tossed out of the ball game. I think this crew was uh, preparing for this when they met out on the infield right there. All mess with Brandon Hyde right now. He's been a little irritated the last couple days, and that is not a good call. Man. So Brandon is out. And the runner's got to go back to third. That run will not score. Oh. Santander's got to go back. Gosh. Here we have seen that the umpire called interference and claimed that the first base fielder was not able to receive the ball because of the path taken by the batter runner. The batter runner was running outside of his dedicated running lane and as such interference was officially called. Let us review what the umpire's duty would be here. Home plate umpire is responsible for making the call and he will declare that the runner did not provide the defensive team with the allocated space in their attempt to make a play. Interference must always be declared as soon as possible. The ball is dead and the batter runner is declared out. No base runners are permitted to advance in this type of interference. The fourth case to discuss in today's session is runner interference. I believe it is important to remember that while on defense with a batted ball put in play, the defensive players always have the precedence and should always be given priority with having a clear ability to make a play. If a defending player is screened or blocked from having a clear line of sight or route to the ball, it should be considered whether or not the offensive player, either batter, runner, or base runner, had obstructed their chance of making a play. Let us watch an example that it was illustrated by youth players at the Little League level. Paying the bunt. Bunted up the first baseline. Luke bobbles it. Schubert stumbled. And he's going to be out of first base. Paying the bunt. Bunted up the first baseline. Luke bobbles it. Schubert stumbled. And he's going to be out of first base. Paying the bunt. Bunted up the first baseline. Luke bobbles it. Schubert stumbled. And he's going to be out of first base. Paying the bunt. In this situation, there is interference because there was obstruction on part of the batter runner who interfered with the defending player attempting to make a play.
the defending player in the act of fielding the ball was unable to have a clear path to the ball and was obstructed by the batter runner who had not yet reached the halfway mark between home and first, which would give him a clear lane for reaching first base. Let us watch another example. Tapper to the left side. A guard, a collision, a tag, and the third base umpire is going to call the runner out. That is Linus Baker. You must give him a chance to field the ball. It'll be called interference. See, you're supposed to pause right there, but by him running through it, he does not give him an opportunity to field the ball. And they call the runner out. And that's one. I mean, as a base runner, you have that ball in front of you. You see it in your line of vision. So you've seen runners before stop and freeze. And when the ball's... Even in this video that you have just seen, this is not a case of intentional interference. The base runner was attempting to get to third base just as the fielder was attempting to field the ground ball. We must always remember here that the defensive player has the precedence. Therefore, it must immediately be called interference by the umpire. What are the appropriate measures to take as an umpire? The umpire must immediately declare interference, again using strong body language and tone of voice, and then declare a dead ball while the base runner is out because of his actions. The batter does not return to hit, but is rewarded for space, so long as no other obstructions are made on his part. The fifth case to examine today is base coach interference. Any physical action made by a base coach to help a runner advance or return to the previous base is deemed to be interference. Therefore, we must be clear whether or not the coach helped the base runner with a physical action. Was there contact? Did he physically touch the base runner and help him achieve his objective on the play? Did he help him stay on the base? If yes, this is definitely base coach interference. Let us be clear here because it is never permitted for a base coach to touch a player when the ball is live. Nor can one base runner help another. Let us watch an example. Left center field, that's okay. That'll get one home, but gets Beltre going around to third. Trout bottles the ball, but Beltre is going to be held at third. Almost ran into the third base coach, Tony Beasley, putting the brakes on. Mike Sosha is going to come out and yeah. argue that he did run into Beasley. I think it was inadvertent, inadvertent, and he, inadvertently that he ran into him. And I don't think he was trying to score, but as a third base coach, you cannot physically stop the runner. You can stop him with a hand signal. You can't stop him with your body. Well, Prince gets the same pitch that Adrian got, pitch right down the middle of the plate. He drives it to left center field. So both guys going back up the middle with a base hit, line drives, picks up a run for the Rangers. Mike Sosha is still out arguing with Dan Ayasonia, the third base coach. 
Yeah, th I think technically that, that is uh, coach interference. I don't think you can touch him. You're allowed to touch him at all. Yeah, Remember it, a few years ago in Detroit? Yeah, Michael, someone, grabbed, someone grabbed Michael Young. Somebody, uh, it was, I think it was, whoever was coaching third at that time. He was in Minnesota, Minnesota, yeah. Just touched him and, and it was called for him. Yeah, Gary Pettis touched him. Pettis did, yeah. Well, Mike Sosha is not going to get that call. He didn't grab him with his hands. He had his hand up stopping him. But where he was located is right in the base path, and he definitely ran into him. It's not like he grabs him to keep him from going. He's there and hold up. Adrian kind of grabbed him. And if I remember right, the ruling was it doesn't matter whether you meant to or not or how much of a ah, touch there yeah, was. Yeah. But, well, the third base coach, uh, umpire, Dan Ayasonia, he had a good look at yeah, it. He was he right on top of it, and he, he was ready with an explanation for Mike Sosha. In any event, three singles with one out here in the first inning. These cases are always up to the umpire's discretion as they saw the play unfold. In this case, the umpire did not declare there to be any interference on the part of the base coach. There must always be physical contact, which there was on this particular play, but that does not always ensure interference will be called. That is because, as you have seen, the umpire decides that there was not a clear act of assistance on the part of the base coach. As such, the base runner stays on his occupied base and the play continues as normal. It is always up to the umpire's discretion, and despite my belief here that there was an act of interference, it was not called. My advice to all umpires is that you should always be aware of any physical contact and whether or not this contact helped the runner because that makes the calling of interference clear and easy to make. Let us watch another example. In this case, we see the base coach indicated to the runner that he should continue on his way to second base, but after seeing how the play was to unfold, physically restrained the runner from advancing and therefore kept him at first base. After an umpire discussion, the act was clearly interference and the out was made. What are the penalties here? As soon as interference is deemed for this type of situation, the umpires must indicate where it occurred and allow the ball to remain live until the end of the play. The base runner is out. Why does the ball remain live? This is because the defense always reserves the right to continue making a play and getting as many outs as possible for that particular batted ball. Therefore, the ball remains live and the base runner is out because of the coach's actions.
The sixth type of interference is when a base runner is hit by a batted ball. Pay particular attention because if the last person to touch this batted ball is a defensive player or the pitcher, then it no longer becomes interference. The ball must directly touch the batter runner. If in the case the defense is playing in for a play at the plate and a batted ball immediately gets past the defender on the infield but he does not make contact with the ball and directly behind this defender a base runner is there and hit by the ball then this is not interference. I strongly advise you to evaluate whether or not there was another defender behind this particular runner struck by the ball because then this situation would be in fact interference given that the defending team still had an opportunity to make a play. Here we have a number of videos that demonstrate a lot of different examples for us to contemplate. In all cases, interference was the correct call. Pitch is lined and it hits the runner. So Martin will be credited with a base hit and DeShields is out. The put out will go to Mark DeShera. He was the closest fielder. So now there's two down. Here's a bullet and it hit him and it hit Tim Anderson. So I guess the right phrase would be the beat goes on. Chop to third. No into the hole and it hits the runner. He's out and the inning is over. Lou Croy could not vault over that high the bounding run is at first base. Ball of the go ahead. Possible double play ball, but it hits Beltre the base pass. Beltre runs right into the out, literally. I'm wondering if Beltre did that on purpose. The well, that hits Pence. He is out. Score that a base hit for Arias, and the put out goes to the closest fielder, Jordy Mercer. Oh, two pitch, and that shot into right field, and it hit Alvarez, oh, wow. and that's the ball game. Wow! Oh my! Tabata will get a hit, but it doesn't matter. Alvarez is hit, and that is how the game ends. Tough though, three and one. Yep. And he pulls it, and it hits the runner. What a break for the Phils. Bohr is awarded first base. The ball's dead once it hits the runner. Now the 2 1. Runner on the move. Ground ball to the right side. It hits the runner. It hits him and goes into right field. And there was no call on the no play. No called it. Second base umpire, Mike Belinsky, is standing right there. No way four umpires can miss that. And now the uh, two corner umpires, first base umpire Marty Foster and Mike Winters, the crew chief, and third base toward the right after it hit him. Yeah. That was a perfectly executed hit and run. On the ground to short, it hit the runner. That'll end the inning. It hit Lagaris. In the inning. Out to short. It hits the runner. Lobatone needs to get himself on first base here. Now oh, he's safe. It's a base hit. Yeah, and I know. 
but he, he was kind of trotting a dead ball anyway. He was drafted and signed by the Phillies in 2008. That hits oh. the runner. And the ball is dead. It's going to be a base hit for Galvis. And he does it again, and it's hit hard, and it hit the runner. A huge break for the A's. Seeger slams his helmet down, it hits the runner, and that means Morrison will get credited with a hit. Double play ball, right at Kinsley, it hits the runner, and he is out, and that prevents the double play. That's actually a good play by Morrison to get hit, because that was going to be an easy 6-4-3 double play. Two from Carpenter. That's an out, and Roland could not avoid it. It's an out, and the runners yeah, back to the bat. Cardinals really catch a break, because the runner at third. Last out. year had eight home runs, 36 runs batted in. There goes the runner on a ground ball up the middle. And did it hit the runner? I think it did. Yep. It hits the runner and the Dodgers win the game. Shades of the Angels. Would you believe that? On the ground. And it hits the runner. And this one is over. <laughs> Unbelievable. The home run. They're still batting. That's huge. Rollins takes off. Utley grounds one toward the middle. Played by Murphy. His throw goes to first. Offline. Did Utley get the bag? I guess he did. And everybody's safe. But they're going to call Rollins, I believe, for interference on the ground ball. They're calling Rollins out, saying that the thing that it hit him, that it hit his leg. Oh, really? I thought they said he just impeded the fielder, but let's see. Rollins makes the mistake of not picking up the ball. He's on a straight steal. And even on a straight steal, you've got to get a peek. Nice call there. Chris Guccione immediately signaled that he had been hit by the ball. What is the right call to be made here? As soon as contact is made from the ball to the base runner, the umpire should make his interference call loud and clear. The ball is immediately declared dead and the base runner is out. The batter is awarded first base and the other base runners return to their previously occupied base. The last case of interference to be discussed today is when a runner is hit by a throw, which is not deemed to be interference. The time for this to be declared interference, however, is when there is a deliberate attempt by the runner to get in the way of the throw. Let us watch an example. Third and Walker in the fourth. Is it Marte in the fifth? Uh, that's a home run in a silo. <laughs> Will it drop in? Nope, Toppy is there. And Calhoun back at the bank at first, out number two. Now it kicks away for Murphy. Cole gonna go to second. Now they got him hung up. Walters was backing up the play and did a tremendous job, and they dropped the ball. McMahon couldn't handle it. They had Cole Calhoun dead to rights. He stuck his head in front of him. Very quick real-time analysis. The rule is there, 601A, intentionally interferes with the thrown ball is the part of the rule that matters. If he intentionally stuck his head into the ball, he's out. If it wasn't intentional, then he's safe. Rob Drake clearly thought it was intentional. Is really... And Torrey is living. Because I think Rob Drake's saying, no, he stuck his arm in front of the ball. No, it hit his head. Torrey's been ejected. Rob Drake has ejected Torrey Lovello on a bizarre play. Walters. Walters, look at the job Walters does backing up the play. Calhoun sees that. Now they got him dead to rights. The throw to McMahon hits him right in the helmet. I don't see anything illegal about that. He just turned his head. 
And he didn't. It, it didn't look to me like he tried to stick his head in front of the ball. It just hit him in the head. Well, Torrey's night is over here. He's had it with Rob Drake. Now he's going to go after Bill Miller, the crew chief. Another look. Well, I mean, he's trying to get himself in a rundown, right? But the ball was thrown right at his at his helmet. That's the kind of player Cole Calhoun is. Well, he's a heady player. <laughs> That's the end of the fifth inning. It's still 3-2 Colorado. Wow. We have seen that there was intentional contact by the base runner with the ball to avoid being tagged out at second base, which was likely to happen should the ball have arrived to the base. Now I have shown a number of videos which demonstrate various kinds of unintentional interference where a ball thrown by a defending player hits a base runner. What is the difference if a base runner or batter runner is involved in the play? In the case of a base runner, so long as there is no intentional interference, the play will not be called as interference. On the other hand, when there is a play at first base and the batter runner runs to first base outside of his designated lane and thus interferes with the play, then interference will be called. Throw to first base and it hits Jung Ho Gun. Well, who was he throwing this to? And Jung Ho chopped out to short. Well, get the out at second oh, base man. and the throw drills Chesler Cuthbert. Oh no. A run scores. The Royals. Oh. Ball hit hard diving stop. And Segura's throw hits Fowler and goes into foul territory. And in the left. Bam, dives the ball, can't come up with it. Votto trying to stretch it to two, and that ball hit him as he slid into the bag. And we'll see what he does here. It's his bare hand, and the throw hit Aoki. And Aoki... And the ball hits Adam. Look, he hit him in the back of the head. Drunk the shot we had of... Robine throws to third and hit the wall. Wow. Let's so vote is okay. Now he's sitting. Hunter setting up for a possible tag. And it's just a bluff. And Hunter gets oh. hit by the throw. Moments ago was outstanding. Six and a third innings. Got a hustle, man. Segura can run. Throw to first. And they're not going to get him. It got on the body line of Segura. Good luck. Slow roller, Tozawa, let's have it make the play, and it gets away from Napoli. Anybody. A little swinging bunt. This will be a tough play for Jimenez, and Polanco will be safe. The ball hit him. Jay Hay goes to third base. Drive to right center field. It's down for a hit. Nunez will round second, head to third. Chisenhall's throw is not in time. It hits Nunez and runs toward home plate. 3-1 pitch. Bouncing ball to share with a good stop goes to second they get no the ball gets dropped Oh, what a break for the Indians as Brendan Ryan and it's gonna go into the dugout and Stephen vote with that hustle is gonna end up at second base uh -oh. so The ball is rolling around all over the place and of course the morning use of scorches <laughs> <laughs> You know that, that left-handed just consistent swing, you know always batting over 300 You know he was so a line drive, caught at second, throw back to first, and France and missed it, and it goes into the dugout. And that is a huge break for the A's. How should these calls be made? There was no intentional interference in these cases. Therefore, the umpire should be making the safe sign with his arms to indicate that the runner is safe where he stands. In the case that there is intentional interference, the ball is dead and the batter runner is out, while all other base runners return to their previously occupied base.
I thank you all for your attention and hope to see you next time.